And for this lecture, we're going to talk about Sarbanes-Oxley. So first, let's hear it from the man himself, Senator Paul Sarbanes. It turned out Enron was a, was a canary in the mine shaft. A, a number of major companies were engaged in convoluted, often fraudulent accounting devices to enhance their earnings, uh, hide losses, and drive up their, their stock prices. At the time, uh, Paul Volcker and Arthur Levitt, of course Volcker, former chairman of the Federal Reserve, and Levitt, former chairman of the SEC, warned uh, that the nation was, had fallen into a collective amnesia toward real pain and the loss investors suffered. Over a period of months, market value of public companies fell by some trillions of dollars. Thousands and thousands of jobs were lost, retirement savings dried up. The Wall Street Journal commenting at the time concluded, the scope and scale of the corporate transgressions of the late 1990s now coming to light exceed anything the U.S. has witnessed since the years preceding the Great Depression. Not but I never expected to be confronted with this, with this sort of situation. The seventh largest company in the country going bankrupt. A number of other uh, it becoming more and more evident day by day. Another a number of other companies were playing the uh, playing the same game. So we were confronted with, you know, how to respond to this. The independent auditor assumes a public responsibility, transcending the the employment relationship with a client. This public watchdog function demands that the accountant maintain independence from the client and requires complete fidelity to the public trust. sarbanes Axley Act of 2002, I remember it well, was a response to financial scandals and associated with the stock market declines in the early 2000s. In fact, if you go back to December of 1999, this is why I remember it so well. I was having lunch with my dad, and we were just at a sub shop, and we were just talking about different things, and I said how I thought the market was crazy. I could not believe how out of control it was, and that I should probably just cash it all in and pay the early withdrawal tax because it's just so overinflated. Well, starting in February and March of 2000, that market started to crash, and I wound up losing over 60% of my uh, value of my IRA at that time. Now, thankfully, we've had 20 years for everything to come back and then some, but I remember feeling so depressed. And so in a way, I was very happy about Sarbanes-Oxley because what it did was it started to get all these corporations in line so that potentially these things wouldn't happen because there were bad ethical decisions being made, weak corporate governance, low audit quality, and insufficient auditor independence. So this was a response to the Enron bankruptcy and collapse of Arthur Anderson, as Paul Sarbanes stated. Sarbanes-Oxley only applies to publicly traded companies. So significant audit-related provisions of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, Title I removes the self-regulation of the auditing profession and replaces it with independent oversight by PCAOB. That's right, we actually self-regulated ourselves until these events happened and the public trust was lost, so we needed PCAOB to restore it through the independent oversight. But I'm just going to hold on to that thought again, independent oversight, and you'll see what I mean in a minute. Section 201 prevents audit firms from providing many consulting services to audit clients, and we've talked about these in previous lectures. Section 204, 301, and 407 significantly expand the power, responsibility, and disclosures of corporate audit committees. Section 404, that was the big one. We did a lot of 404 work when this came out. It requires management assessment and external audit firm attestation regarding the effectiveness of internal control over financial reporting. And that's because a lot of work was done in internal audit departments to assure management that the controls were in place. Management was going to have to sign off on these reports. They could go to jail for these reports. So it became a heavy project for many public corporations and an increase in internal audit staff 
that also then help the external audit staff. So some of the highlights before we get into the details of the numbers is it established PCAOB, so it's a not-for-profit, and it's not an agency of the government. Accounting firms must register with PCAOB, which we've talked about that before, if they want to audit publicly traded companies. PCAOB performs inspections of these registered audit firms. PCAOB can discipline these firms. And here's the kicker. The registered firms will pay for the PCAOB operations. So when we talked about independent, yet they're all paying for the PCAOB to exist in its operations. Uh, it had extensive rules in Sarbanes-Oxley about audit or independence that needed to be clarified or expanded. As far as corporate responsibilities, some of these audit committees were not really made up of people with financial backgrounds, and many companies didn't even have audit committees. But now if you were going to be public, you had to have an audit committee, and it had to have some financial expertise on it. And they had to have those internal controls and management's oversight of those controls and the corporate governance. There had to be enhanced disclosures about conflicts of interest, how the assessment of internal controls went. Material shareholders and management must disclose any transactions that they have with the company. So again, Title I, Public Company Oversight Board Existence, this is how it was established, 101. Then 102, the regulation of the board. 103 was the auditing, quality control, and independent standards and rules. 104, inspection of those companies. 105, investigation and disciplinary proceedings. 106, if you're a foreign public accounting firm, but you were doing work with a publicly traded company in the United States, you needed to follow PCAOB. 107, commission oversight of the board. 108, accounting standards. And 109, funding. So that's the basics of PCAOB. Then it said it, auditor independence. 201 is talking about those services outside the scope of the practice of auditors. 202, pre-approval requirements. 203, audit partner rotation. 204, audit reports to the audit committees. 205, conforming amendments. 206, conflicts of interest. 207, study of mandatory rotation of registered public accounting firms. The third title, Corporate Responsibility, 301 about public company audit committees, 302 corporate responsibility for those financial reports, 303 improper influence on of audits, and then Title IV, Enhanced Financial Disclosures, 401 was disclosures in periodic reports, 402 was enhanced conflict of interest provisions, 403 was disclosure of transactions involving management and principal stockholders. And 404, the big one, management assessment of internal controls. So you hear a lot of SOX 404 work. And then 406, the code of ethics for senior financial officers. And finally, 407, disclosure of audit committee financial experts. And if you want to see the details of any of these titles, you can go to the sec.gov. And that concludes our review of Sarbanes-Oxley.